In today's video, I am going to be breaking down how the Philippines lost to the Dominican Republic because the Philippines started off the game very strong. They got a lot of defensive stops and they were able to get a lot of baskets at the beginning. And then it sort of trailed off. So let's get down and let's really analyze this game. So in one of the first possessions that the Dominican Republic had on the defensive side was a very strong steal that led them into a three on two situation. And of course, that really does demoralize your team. The Dominican was stayed on the attack in this situation now, and they continued to attack the basket on offense. However, here we can see that the game was still tied with about halfway through the first quarter. This was a very strong outing by the Philippines, and of course, when on defense, Kai Soto was extremely strong. However, he needs to keep his hands up on the defensive side, as we can see here. He does reach, and remember the saying, you reach, I teach. Well, guess what? On the weak side, we have a cutter, and Kai's hands are down. If Kai's hands were up, this would be a much harder pass to make, and because of that, this does lead to a very easy layup. However, on the offensive side, this screen and roll really does show us that Kai Soto is playing a lot more aggressive in these later games. This is something that I did mention in an earlier video. I like to see Kai Soto really rim run after a screen and roll, and that's what he did here. Now here we see just a small mistake by Kai Soto where he pretty much does the splits and that leaves a lane open for his player to attack the rim. Now there's no reason to really, really attack out when you're 7 feet tall going up against a player who may only be around 6 feet tall or even shorter. What Kai Soto should have done here was instead of running out, he should have played both players by staying in the middle, having his hands up on either side, that way because of his size if this player decided to attack he would be fine if this player decided to shoot Kai Soto would be able to contest and then of course if that pass goes over to this player which we do see here Kai Soto would have been at least in position to cut off this drive however I do really like to see the Philippines attacking the paint against what we have seen here which is a zone and then kicking that ball out for a three-point shot this is what you need to do against the zone and it's worked really well for pretty much everybody now what we're gonna see here is something that I tell a lot of players to do if you do jump to try and block or contest a three-point shot what you need to do as soon as you do that is to run down the court because whether or not that basket is made either we're going to have the basketball either in play or out of bounds. So when that happens, if you can get your butt down court before the other team's players, you should have a good possibility of being wide open for, of course, in this case, a slam dunk. And as we can see here, the Philippines started off really, really well. Now, after this screen, we see Kai Soto attacking the rim really strong. Now, we also do see that this defense has really shifted over and left a player wide open for a three-point shot. And that's what happens here. That's a very small, smart point guard who can understand what the defense is doing so that he can pass that ball around to an open three-point shooter. Now what we see here is something that is concerning to myself. How I would like to see Kai Soto playing this is by cutting off the baseline. Don't allow the player to have baseline and that's what he's doing by having his feet shoulder width apart standing straight up. He is forcing his help side defender to come down and drop down to play help defense or to double team. And that's not what you want to do. I understand the concept that Kai Soto is trying to go for, which is to get that player underneath the backboard. I understand it. It's a smart concept. But sometimes when you're playing against a very smart passer, you really just want to take that guy one-on-one -on -one and not allow him to get players open. And that's what happens here. There was the help side defender that dropped down, and of course, the Dominican were able to hit a three-point shot here that got them even closer before halftime. Due to Kai Soto's height advantage against their center, Kai Soto should have, what he should have been doing here is had his left foot right there and pretty much been way on, right on top of that guy and having his hands straight up because I can tell you right now, a player with that height is not going to be able to score on Kai Soto very easily if you take him one-on-one. -on -one. 
Now, as we can see here, they're going up against a 2-3 zone. We got the, the, top, the bottom row of the 2-3 of the zone playing a bit high. They're trying to protect that high post, which then opens up the Russian spot. So this is a great strategy to run. Just basically a 1-3-1 offense, get one guy in the high post, a guy in the low post along the baseline. And usually what you want to do is to get that ball into the high post. That draws up the middle defender. You can then pass it down to Kai Soto in this case and get yourself a dunk. However, because that 2-3 zone was playing just so high, the, the point guard here for the Philippines was able to see that instead of passing to the high post player, he just sent up an alley-oop because this bottom three were playing just so high. And because of that, he was able to get that alley-oop and an absolutely fantastic dunk by Kai Soto. Now in this situation right here, this is why I say to never actually jump for a three. However, if you do jump for a three, you want to get down court. But this is why you never want to jump for a three. It's because this team, the Dominican, and any other team, they will notice that you are jumping for their threes, and they will fake you out. They will do a shot fake, and they are going to be able to hit deep three-point shots. In this case, that got them within two points at halftime. Now this is why I say Kawame could actually make it in the NBA. I'm not too sure if he would be a starter, but I know he would be able to make it in the NBA. He's able to play super strong, playing the high post. As soon as he catches that ball, he understands he needs to attack that rim, and that's what he does, and he's able to finish strong over a pretty strong defender. However, I really want to show you this angle too. Watch this. Only one dribble. This is very important. If you're within this key, you want to only take one dribble at max when you're attacking the rim. That is going to speed you up, but also limit how much defensive abilities that this guy will have. However, now we start seeing sloppy passes and sloppy receiving. And this is what happens sometimes with teams that may not be ready or at least used to playing at this level. So what we see here is... A one-handed pass, which is totally fine. However, when he makes this one-handed pass, he is making it to the chest of this player, and there is a defender who is playing extremely tight. What you would want to do here is to aim a bit higher, so that now that player could either receive it with one or both hands and spin back this way and let that defender to continue forward which can get you an open three-point shot or you could attack the basket draw in a help side defender kick it out for a three whatever it may be however here that pass gets intercepted but it's not all the passers fault here it's actually the receivers fault as well so what the receiver does here is he stops to receive that ball. That is the biggest mistake that you can do if you've got a defender breathing down your neck. What you want to do is to run to the ball, run through the ball, catch it that way. Because if you stop, that defender is going to reach around and his momentum is going to allow him to pick off that ball and of course go down for a layup. However, when he comes off of that dribble and he does that one-handed pass, you as the receiver need to run through the ball. Keep on going. Don't stop. Your defender's going to get that ball. And now because of all of the turnovers that were happening, the offensive team is now feeling it. They are motivated. They are now feeling the basketball gods on their side, essentially. And they're going to be able to hit shots like this even more because now they're feeling like they're going to be winning this game. And when that happens, you're in big trouble. Now, coming off of a screen, what you want to do is exactly what you see here. You want to see a little bit of a hedge. You want to fight over. You want to then catch up to your man. Hedger goes back. However, what we do see here is some lazy defense. And what I mean by lazy defense is he is paying attention to the ball, not paying attention to his man. He is paying attention to the, to the ball, not paying attention to his man. He is paying attention to the ball, not paying attention to his man. There's a little bit of an issue here because, of course, now we're seeing that they're all paying attention to the ball. When that happens, there's going to be players who are going to then cut back door. And that's what we see here. He cuts back door because his defender is not paying attention to anything except for the ball handler. And because of that, his man cuts back door. He's in position now to say, oh no, I'm going to be benched. And then, of course, his, his player goes up for a nasty slam. Never, ever get complacent on defense. 
Don't stand straight up with a slightly hunched back. Don't let your heels touch that ground. Stay quick. Know where your defender is. He should have been facing this way, not this way. If he was facing this way, he would be able to tell, hey, I got half of my sight on him, half of my sight on him, and with my peripheral vision, I'm going to be seeing about three quarters of that court. And because of that, I'll be fine. Next is to have him just a bit farther down either bit a bit farther down depending on what this screener is doing or exactly where he is but looking forward knowing with his hands where each of those players are so if this player is shooting a three then you would want him to be either farther in and him farther down or exactly where he is but not 100% of his sight looking here. You want him to look forward so that he can have his peripheral vision working for him. Essentially, you always want to have at least half of your eyesight on the player you're defending and then the other half, whatever is happening on the other side of the court. And that is essentially what happened in this game. The Philippines came out really strong. However, some of their turnovers that they made on the offensive side of the ball really started to hurt them, and then it didn't help that their defense was starting to become a little bit more lazy. And the com combination between those two factors really started to make the score of this game wider. So, in the future, this is a very good team. We, As the world, I'm a Canadian, we have to really watch out for these Philippines players because they are going to be a very good team in the future. There's just some small things that they need to fix, and whether or not a few of them make it to the end NBA or not, when they get to the world stage, they're going to be a team to reckon with. Reckon with. Anyways, I hope that you've enjoyed. If you have, hit that like button, subscribe. I'll see you guys again next time.